So um, my talk today, I'm going to be looking at um, reconfiguration of brain networks in patients with disorders of consciousness. Here's the general outline. We're going to first look at functional connectivity patterns associated with unconsciousness. Um, and we're not going to start with disorders of consciousness. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to see my slides while, while uh, having the... Um, having the little zoom thing go. Okay, let's try this. So uh, we're not going Stephanie, to start Stephanie, sorry for interrupting you. Uh, oh, there's okay. a little bit of interference with the mic. Um, I don't know if maybe it's because you're touching um, the mic or... Is this couldn't... better now? Yeah, I think it's better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we're not going to start off with disorders of consciousness, which are very, very heterogeneous and very uh, messy. We're going to start off with insights from anesthetic induced unconsciousness, which is a lot cleaner and a lot easier to control. Once we have an idea of what we're looking for based on our knowledge of anesthetic induced unconsciousness, we're going to look at baseline functional connectivity patterns in patients with disorders of consciousness. And I'm going to conclude by looking at the adaptive reconfiguration of connectivity in DOZ patients uh, and specifically what this tells us about um, clinical diagnosis and prognosis. So just to bring us all onto the same page, when I speak of consciousness and disorders of consciousness, um, I'm referring to, I, I like looking at this particular graph of consciousness, which divides consciousness into two axes, wakefulness along the X axis and awareness along the Y axis. And for most individuals, we traverse the diagonal of this, of this two-dimensional space. We have um, deep sleep where there's low wakefulness and low awareness and uh, conscious wakefulness, which is the state that I hope most of us are in right now, with high levels of awareness and high levels of wakefulness. But occasionally there are other states, pathological or pharmacologically induced, uh, which bring us off of this diagonal, and um, several of them are disorders of consciousness. So we have minimally conscious state, where we have relatively high levels of wakefulness. You have sleep-wake cycles, for example, um, and minimal levels of awareness of the environment. And we have vegetative state where you have individuals who are unable to uh, be, uh, are not aware of their environment, the environment, they are unconscious, yet they have high levels of wakefulness. Their eyes are open and they engage in um, wakeful behavior. And these are two disorders of consciousness, including, uh, and, and coma is another disorder of consciousness where you have low level of wakefulness and awareness. So um, the way that these disorders of consciousness are currently clinically behaviorally assessed, the gold standard is something called the Coma Recovery Scale Revised. And using the Coma Recovery Scale Revised, um, when, when we look at clinical bedside diagnosis of disorders of consciousness, we know that there is a misdiagnosis rate of over 40%. Um, in other words, over 40% of individuals who were diagnosed as vegetative state, what used to be called vegetative state, now it's called unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. Uh, these, these individuals, when we assess them with the coma recovery scale revised, they actually show some signs of command following, some signs of awareness of their environment. Beyond this, uh, beyond this 40% misdiagnosis rate with the CRSR, um, there have been some seminal studies, one by Adrian Owen's group in, uh, that was published in 2006, which showed that um, individuals who were uh, in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome were able to demonstrate uh, awareness of, of commands in their environment and to follow commands in their environment. Um, this is the, the famous study where um, it, they asked an individual to play tennis in the scanner and to imagine navigating their home in their scanner. And this person was able to reliably follow um, commands and, and activate the appropriate areas in their brain in spite of their, um, their diagnosis of unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. And it's been shown uh, that the same, the same um, 
detection of command following can be done with EEG at the bedside. Uh, the study that I've cited here is, is one where an individual was asked to imagine squeezing the right hand or squeezing the left hand and activating the appropriate area of their motor cortex. So these, this is, um, these are cases that have been called uh, cognitive motor dissociation um, by Nico Schiff, and uh, they represent individuals who are completely disconnected from their environment in terms of their behavior, but still have some level of awareness. And these are likely um, still an underestimation of the number of individuals who are conscious but unable to uh, unable to uh, to, to behavior uh, behaviorally express uh, that they are conscious. So when we look at the commands involved in, uh, for example, imagine playing tennis, there's a lot of cognitive circuits that need to be active in order to follow this. And if an individual is in pain, if an individual has a lot of fatigue or is confused, unable to understand the commands because of some sort of linguistic barrier, they may still be conscious, but unable to demonstrate it in these, these, um, these these types of paradigms, experimental paradigms. So we are looking for markers in the brain, in my lab, that can determine whether an individual is conscious or unconscious, even if an individual cannot follow commands. So in order to do this, uh, we, are, we start with insights from anesthetic-induced unconsciousness, because anesthesia is a nice, controlled substance where we can turn consciousness off and then in a very controlled titrated manner turn consciousness back on. So we are looking, I'm going to start off with um, a study that uses the anesthetic ketamine in surgical patients. We, we looked at 28 surgical patients with eight channel EEG and uh, for those eight channels we measured the functional connectivity between each of the channel pairs. So functional connectivity is a measure of the statistical dependency of two different signals. Um, and what you're looking at here on the screen um, is uh, he, we're looking at all the different bandwidths and in the alpha band, we see this significant decrease in the functional connectivity between frontal and parietal regions of the brain. In baseline, the frontal parietal um, phase-like index is high and when under ketamine-induced unconsciousness, it is quite low. The, uh, the graph on the right shows you something quite similar. It's the same data, but um, you can see it on a channel by channel basis. What we're looking at is the decrease between baseline and ketamine-induced unconsciousness. And you'll see that it's not a uniform decrease across uh, all electrodes, that there's a, there's a selective decrease that is maximal across frontal parietal areas. And you can see that on the brain map over here. So we know here from uh, this data set that, um, the, that there is a selective frontal parietal functional connectivity decrease during unconsciousness. Uh, we see the same thing with a different type of anesthetic called sevoflurane. This data set uh, we collected at the University of Michigan, and it was unique in the sense that we slowly titrated the sevoflurane and brought individuals just over the borderline of unconsciousness. So we had um, individuals were receiving sevoflurane, which is an inhaled anesthetic, and we slowly increased it by um, increments of 0.2% up until the individuals stopped responding to a command we held them just over the borderline of unconsciousness for 10 minutes, and then we gradually decreased the sevoflurane levels until they re regained response to command as well. And so the, clearly this is not a, um, a surgical uh, condition, uh, but even over just over this borderline of anesthetic-induced unconsciousness, we see that um, there's a significant decrease in PLI, phase-like index, in frontal parietal, frontal temporal, and frontal occipital electrodes, and that this is not just significant on a group level. This is also um, this is also evident on an individual subject basis. So these are the seven subjects, and you can see for each subject there is a significant decrease in the functional connectivity between here in this case frontal occipital uh, electrodes.
We can also, in addition to functional connectivity, we can also look at directed functional connectivity. This is a measure that takes into account the lead leg relationship between two signals, in this case, two electrode pairs. So uh, in our case, we, uh, in, in the case that I'm showing here, we used a directed functional connectivity um, metric of directed PLI, directed phase leg index. And we are looking at this, the, the same data set that we had um, in the first slide where we, where we were doing anesthetic uh, ketamine-induced unconsciousness of 28 surgical patients. In this case, the directed phase leg index is neutral when uh, is, sorry, is at, when it's at 0 0.5, there's no consistent lead leg relationship. When the um, DPLI is higher than 0.5, one signal is consistently leading another. And when the DPLI is lower than 0 0.5, one signal is consistently lagging the other. So here in, um, in this figure that you're seeing in figure B, you see that in the experimental data, in the baseline, you see the large lead leg relationship because the DPLI is higher than 0.5 between frontal parietal regions when uh, the, uh, in baseline resting conditions. And upon ketamine-induced unconsciousness, this neutralizes. It becomes um, 0 0.5, which means that there's a random lead leg relationship. You see the same thing in um, the figure at the bottom, so figure C. In this case, uh, red is phase lead dominant and blue is phase leg dominant. These are the frontal electrodes connected to the parietal electrodes. So you see a strong frontal parietal lead leg relationship in baseline conditions, which is also represented on this brain map and under ketamine induced unconsciousness, this neutralizes. So this data set showed us that uh, this feedback dominant connectivity that we see in baseline neutralizes during unconsciousness. Uh, we also, it, this is not, this phenomenon is not just um, unique to the metric of DPLI. Uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Michigan, Anchol Lee, uh, ran a very similar study using not DPLI, but symbolic transfer entropy, which is a nonlinear extension of Granger causality. Uh, and for those of you who are uh, less familiar with this, just a, a 30 second tutor tutorial on symbolic transfer entropy. You have two signals, signal X and signal Y. Uh, X being the source signal, Y being the target signal. And the symbolic transfer entropy allows you to quantify if you have signal Y, the past of signal Y being able to predict the, the future, being able to predict the future of signal Y. If I add the past of signal X into that equation, how much does the prediction of the future of signal Y improve? And if, this, if the addition of the past of X improves the prediction of the future of Y, I say that X Granger causes Y. So we look at um, we looked at the symbolic transfer entropy of um, frontal parietal signals across three different types of anesthesia: ketamine, propofol, and sevoflurane. In these uh, three graphs, the red is the feedback dominance, the blue is the feed forward dominance, and you'll see across all three anesthetics, there is in the baseline state before this blue bar. There is a feedback dominance, so the feedback is much, much higher. In this blue bar, the individual becomes um, anesthetized, so there is the induction period, and the feedback dominance drops. And when they are unconscious after this blue bar, there is no, um, th there is no feedback dominance. It becomes neutral. And so what we're seeing here is that um, the, the feedback dominance uh, that we see in baseline states neutralizes during unconsciousness. We can also look at graph theor theoretical analysis of brain networks to characterize the unconscious brain. Um, this is a, a, a figure from Ed Bulmore and Olaf Sporn's uh, paper in Nature and Neuroscience that demonstrates how um, we can apply graph theory to brain networks. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, uh, just to, again, just a, a quick 30 second tutorial. 
we can take nodes uh, in the brain and that can be from an, uh, like an anatomical parcellation or in the case of EEG networks, we can use each of the electrodes as a node and then measure the amount of connectivity between these individuals. Sometimes the connectivity is structural connectivity. Sometimes the connectivity is functional connectivity. We create a graph by thresholding this according to the strength of the connectivity. Um, and with this graph, we can characterize uh, um, the, the graph using uh, things like the, the degree of each node, the clustering coefficients, um, the, the motifs that are present inside the network, um, modularity of it, the global efficiency of it, and we are able to get a sense of the graph properties of the, of the brain. So we applied this analysis um, to look at the data set where we were anesthetizing patients with sevoflurane, gradually increasing the, the titration level. And we looked, we were particularly interested in the network hubs of the, of the brain. We looked at the degree, so the number of other nodes that a single node was connected to, and we looked at the, betwe the betweenness centrality of the network. And so in, figure, in this figure, we have the degree at the top the between the centrality at the bottom, and we are looking at baseline, the transition to unconsciousness, um, the unconscious state, the transition back to consciousness and recovery. And what you'll see across these five states is that in baseline and in recovery, the degree and the between the centrality is located uh, in the posterior regions of the brain, and that both undergo a degree of anteriorization during anesthetic induced unconsciousness. And keep in mind, this is very light unconsciousness. These are, these are individuals who are just over the borderline of, of sevoflurane induced unconsciousness. The degree and between the centrality of the network are both markers of hubs. And so we, um, we interpret these findings by saying that the network hubs are posterior in baseline rest and they undergo anteriorization during unconscious, during unconsciousness. So just to summarize what we've learned from, from, uh, from our anesthetic studies, we know that in individuals who are conscious, we should be able to see some level of frontal parietal feedback dominant connectivity, and we should see posterior network hubs. And then in individuals who are unconscious, we should see either a neutralization of feedback dominant connectivity or a reversal, so feed forward dominant connectivity, and we should see anterior network hubs. And with these tools in hand, uh, my students and I decided to uh, look at these properties in patients with disorders of consciousness. So we recorded um, EEG in baseline states from individuals in disorders of consciousness. Uh, we had 26 patients recruited to this study. Uh, eight of them came from our collaborators, um, Adrian Owens group at Western University in Ontario, and 18 of them were recorded from McGill University uh, since I started in 2016. We recorded 128 channel EEG either during rest or during a listening task, and we looked at the functional connectivity, the directed functional connectivity, and graph theory. Uh, you'll, see from, you'll see from the demographic table over here that uh, our patients were from a large age range, uh, many, many different types of injuries, some traumatic brain injury, some anoxic injury, many strokes, because we recruited quite heavily from the Montreal Neur Neurological Hospital. And then we had a good mix of both chronic and ac acute um, patients. I'm just going to pause for a second. Kiara, are you seeing just my screen, or are you seeing me move the this um, this this video around as well? Uh, I only see your screen. Okay, okay. good. I'm, I I thought it was uh, distracting. It that's good. Thank you. So here are the results from our functional connectivity analysis for just the baseline state. I'm going to walk you through these um, uh, uh, slowly. So we have um, four different types of, of uh, 
disorders of consciousness here. And this was uh, the way that we classified this was with the coma recovery scale revised. So these are behavioral classifications of consciousness. We had two who were in coma, uh, five who were in an acute state of unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. So within 30 days of their injury, um, we had three who were chronic and were unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. And all of these were over a year since their injury. And we had two who were chronic minimally conscious state. So what we're looking right at right now is the directed functional connectivity in these, in these patients. And uh, the question that we're interested in is, is this useful for diagnosis? And is this use is useful for prognosis? So the answer to the diagnosis question comes quite easily. We'll see that um, we see the feedback dominant connectivity in both co coma patients. We see feedback dominant connectivity in three of the, maybe even four of the patients who are in acute unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. But we only see um, uh, feedback dominant connectivity in one of the chronic unresponsive wakefulness syndrome patients and in neither of the chronic minimally conscious state patients. So this is not a useful measure for diagnosis, if, at least in with respect to the um, coma recovery scale um, measures of consciousness. So let's take a look at these measures uh, in terms of prognosis of these patients. We followed these patients for three months after we did our baseline recording and, um, and followed them actually just called the last one last week just to make sure that they hadn't recovered and, and uh, determined whether they recovered from the disorder of consciousness or not. The four that I've highlighted with red boxes have recovered consciousness eventually. And we'll see that all patients who did recover consciousness demonstrate feedback dominant connectivity. However, several patients who did not recover also demonstrate feedback, uh, did, uh, demonstrate feedback dominant connectivity. So this is also not a useful measure for prognosis. Let's do a similar um, look at baseline hub locations in disorders of consciousness patients. So um, if we look at diagnosis, we see posterior hubs in one of the coma patients, one, two, three of the acute um, unresponsive wakefulness syndrome patients, but not in the chronic minimally conscious state patients. So this is not a useful diagnostic measure. Um, and it's also not a useful prognostic measure. So the same four patients recovered and all four of them have posterior hubs, but so do some who did not recover. For example, um, WSAS 22 over here, which I'm highlighting with my mouse. So um, what, I, what I just showed you was that the baseline functional connectivity patterns alone are not useful for diagnosis or prognosis in this um, population, which sets the stage for the, um, the main message I want to share with you today. I want to uh, show you a study that we, that we conducted looking at the adaptive reconfiguration of these connectivity uh, patterns in our patient population. So this was our uh, this was our study design. We had uh, twelve patients who we recorded high density EEG from pre anesthesia, uh, during anesthesia, which um, where we were targeting an effect site concentration of two micrograms per milliliter with propofol anesthetic, and then we let the anesthesia. Um, um, uh, clear from their system until it became less than 0.05 micrograms per milliliter. And then we recorded five more minutes of EEG after the anesthetic. We looked at alpha network hubs and alpha DPLI pre, during, and post anesthesia. And we looked at the reconfiguration index of the hub, the dynamic reconfiguration index of the hub, and the dynamic reconfiguration index of the DPLI. By the dynamic reconfiguration index, we were talking about how much do the hubs change and how much does the DPLI change across these different conditions. So here is, a, a, I know this is a bit of a busy figure, but I wanted to show you all of our participants. Um, and I'm going to zoom in on three so that we can actually see the details of this. But these are the DPLI plots of all 12 of our DOC participants. You're looking at them divided between individuals who eventually did recover consciousness, 
There were four of those in panel A, and then uh, eight individuals who did not recover consciousness in panel B. And uh, just to orient you to the figure, this column here is before anesthetic. Um, this column is during anesthetic, and this column is after anesthetic. So I'm going to zoom in on three of them so that we can see the details. The first is participant one, who was um, in a coma. And we see that in the baseline state, this individual had feedback dominant connectivity when they were exposed to anesthesia that reversed. So they, they showed feed forward connect dom dominant connectivity. And then when the anesthesia was taken away, we have a return to this feedback dominant connectivity. And this, as you will remember from 20 minutes ago, matches what we see in healthy individuals. And you'll notice that across all individuals who recovered consciousness, while some of the, the patterns are a little bit pathological, all of them demonstrate a feedback feed dominant frontal parietal connectivity that is either reversed or neutralized during anesthesia and then returns post, um, post anesthesia. Within the eight individuals who did not recover consciousness, we see a variety of patterns. I'm gonna highlight two that I find very interesting. This is participant seven, who was in an unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. At the baseline, this individual demonstrates a, a feedback dominant connectivity, which might make us suspect that he has the capacity for consciousness. However, upon exposure to anesthesia, while the feedback dominant connectivity uh, shifts, it still remains feedback dominant. And when the anesthesia is removed, we see, um, again, a, a feedback dominance. Uh, and so we, don't, we do not see a neutralization and we do not see a reversal to feed forward dominance yeah. in this individual. Another interesting pattern here is the individual who is in chronic, um, minimally conscious state. They don't have any consolidated patterns of feedback uh, or feed forward dominant connectivity during baseline. There's some consolidation, but it is, it is um, not feedback or feed forward dominant when they're exposed to anesthesia. And again, back to a scattered pattern um, when the anesthesia is removed. We conducted a very similar analysis looking at the brain network hub locations in these two, uh, these two groups of the recovered and the non-recovered individuals. Um, and once again, I'm just going to highlight three so that we can see the details. This is participant one who was in the coma. We see posterior hubs in baseline and anteriorization in do when they ex were exposed to anesthesia and then back to posterior hubs. And this is consistent what we see in individuals who have the capacity for consciousness. You'll notice once again, that across all individuals who are, uh, who recovered consciousness, they exhibit this level of anteriorization of their network hubs. In those who did not recover consciousness, we have participant eight who has some level of posterior hubs in the baseline state. However, when they were exposed to anesthesia, their network hubs did not show this adaptive reconfiguration. They stayed posterior. And when the anesthesia was removed, the hubs also stayed posterior. There was no reconfiguration of this brain network in response to the perturbation of anesthesia. Uh, this is a participant who was in minimally conscious state. And once again, the hubs were um, anterior, so pathologically located when they were uh, in a uh, when they were when they were in a baseline state, and the brain network did not reconfigure when the individual was exposed to anesthesia. So we developed in my lab. We developed a, an adaptive reconfiguration index that looked at the degree of hub dynamic reconfiguration and DPLI dynamic reconfiguration, and plotting our two uh, our twelve subjects across this space we are able to distinguish those who recover, eventually recover consciousness from those who do not recover consciousness with 100% accuracy. We ran a K-means clustering algorithm with a leave one subject out um, uh, across all 12 of our, of our subjects. And uh, we can clearly distinguish those who recover consciousness from those who don't. We're very encouraged by these findings. Um, this idea of being able to use anesthesia as 
a, a way of unmasking an individual's capacity for consciousness. Um, we've used in several other studies. I'm just going to highlight one of them that looked at brain motif topographies in disorders of consciousness patients. So when you develop a brain work network, specifically a directed brain network, you can look at many different characteristics, including brain motifs. If you have a three node motifs, there are 13, uh, there are 13 possible configurations. Um, however, if you are looking at a metric like directed phase like index, which is only pointing in one direction, there are only five possible motifs that are available to you. So we looked at the motifs that the brain networks of disorders of consciousness patients participated in, and we compared two individuals in a, in a, in a two case in a two case study, both of them who were in unresponsive playfulness syndrome. In the first case, this individual eventually recovered. We looked at uh, all five of these motifs. Motif one and motif seven were significant. During baseline and um, we looked at, at the similarity of these motifs to those of healthy controls. We measured the cosine similarity between the motif topography of uh, each individual to the healthy controls that we had recorded. And they were not terribly convincing. There was um, not, a, not a great similarity. However, when we looked at the motif rearrangement upon anesthesia and then um, the reconfiguration of the motifs when the individual recovered from anesthesia, we saw a large reconfiguration of the motifs. You can see it in figure B over here. This is the similarity of the motifs to baseline, a major decrease in the sim similarity upon anesthesia, and then a return to the baseline reconfiguration of the motifs when the anesthesia was removed. And this patient eventually recovered consciousness. The second case is also unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, but the individual did not recover. Um, the, in the baseline state, motif one wasn't very similar to our healthy controls, but motif seven showed quite a bit of similarity. However, when we looked at how the motifs reconfigured when the individual was exposed to propofol anesthesia, we see not too much reconfiguration. Uh, which you can see in panel B over here. And when we removed it, again, it didn't return to its configuration, its topographic configuration, um, its baseline topographic configuration. And so uh, we are very interested in this idea of using anesthesia as a perturbation agent for the brain to look at its capacity to rearrange itself in response to some sort of external stimulus. And uh, we see a lot of promise in using this technique as a way of unmasking uh, the brain's capacity for eventual recovery of consciousness. So just to conclude, uh, we, I've shown you that functional and directed functional connectivity patterns aren't directly associated with an individual's current level of consciousness, but it's associated with the capacity for consciousness um, in patients with disorders of consciousness. Um, I've shown you that in the, with the baseline data that spurious feedback connectivity patterns and network hub locations can exist and they aren't markers of level of consciousness. However, when we perturb a brain network with anesthesia, um, the capacity of the brain network to adaptively reconfigure, re reconfigure itself in response to this anesthetic perturbation shows promise for the prognostication in DOC patients. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank my lab. This, these are four of the students who were uh, very involved in collecting this data. This data is not easy to get. We um, anesthetize these disorders of consciousness patients and bring them into the hospital. Sometimes they come from very far away and we have to arrange for a few nights stay in Montreal. It's quite complicated and these are um, my, my, my superheroes and their superhero poses. Uh, Catherine Duclos, my postdoc, Yassine, uh, Natalia, and Danielle, um, our clinical collaborators at the Montreal Neurological Hospital who took care of our patients while they were un under anesthesia and in Hamil Hamilton Health Science, uh, Adrian Owen's lab for the baseline DOC data, and then, of course, uh, my sources of funding. That is all I wanted to uh, share with you right now. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have.